we have such a thing as bases. The idea of basis and dimension. <coughs> where if you're given any vector space and say V has a basis of V1, V2, up to Vn. Now, what if I say it's a basis, <coughs> what, what two pieces of information am I saying about this bunch of vectors? <coughs> One is they're linearly independent. Two is they're spanning. A linear com any linear combination of this will get you everywhere, right? So it spans the entire vector space. So if you're given a basis, that means that these guys are linearly independent. The span of the vectors is the entire vector space. And then we also, we go ahead and call the dimension of V, normally if you write it, you dim V is equal to, well, how many how many vectors did you need to make a basis? That's unique. The number of vectors within a basis is unique. The basis itself is not, just how many there are. Other things that are useful on this is because this is linearly independent, that would mean for any vector here, which I get C1, V1 plus C2, V2, plus everything up to Cn, Vn, the Ci are unique. A unique combination gets you places. And that's because of linear independence. Now, because it's also a basis, which means it's a spanning set, that means everywhere in the space has a unique representation which would be, how many of each do you need? What is that unique linear combination that would get you there? And so if that's true, if you have your vector space, and you have your object x, what you could do is say that this object x could have what we're going to call as the coordinates of x in basis v1, v2, up to vn, and we'll just say that this is coordinates are made up of c1, c2, cn. So the coordinates themselves are a vector, really, but I'm only using the vector to store it. And it just tells you how much of each basis is necessary to get you where you're interested in. So you have your entire vector space. So if you have a basis for it, so you had P3 space, and you have a basis for P3, three-term polynomials, and you come up with a basis for it, it would say this unique combination of these basis vectors will get you to this polynomial. And some other polynomial would have a different combination. And some other polynomial would have a unique combination, where those combinations are the coordinates to get you there. Obviously, the most obvious one for this is the standard basis. In other words, for example, if I had R3, and I talk about places like, oh, here's this object right here that is made up of so many of these, and then so many of these, and then so many of these, where what I have is, if this is vector x, vector x is made up of so many of 1, 0, 0. 
that would be the x-coordinate system, the y-coordinate system, the z-coordinate system, and then so many of 0, 1, zeros, and then so many of 0, 0, 1s, and these obviously are C1, C2, C3. When I write this as the normal way that I write a vector, what did I write? I wrote the coordinates. And this is under the standard basis. And the standard basis, when we look at it, uh, being E1, E2, E3, is the standard basis. Now, we've used this forever. The standard basis works great. Why? 1, 0, 0, obviously this only talks about x's, this only talks about y's, this only talks about z's. There isn't anything else going on, you know, this is, why don't we just simply st say standard works? Well, instead of talking about R3, let's go down to R1 and think about maybe we use other bases because they're a little bit more useful for us. Why other bases? Consider R1. Here's 0. Here's x in R1. Then somebody else goes along and says, my favorite measurement is inches. And somebody else comes along here and says, you know what? My favorite measurement is feet. Now obviously, this is the true quantity, x. Is there a standard measurement of one-dimensional space? No. We use centimeters, meters, miles, kilometers, feet, inches, micrometers, astronomical units. Why? Which is most useful in the moment? You know, if I measure about this far, right, about the width of your arms, inches, maybe, maybe centimeters if you want, or maybe millimeters if you want to get really accurate. How many steps did it take? Well, maybe yards. Right. How long is that? Well, it's a football field. Nah, let's use yards or meters. Right. Well, but what about from here to Mars? All right, let's not use inches. <laughs> right. Measurements would have different purposes to have different bases. And when we would have things, I might go through something and say, oh, look, one person said I had 2.1 feet. And then they say what? They had a coordinate of 2.1, but then what does the word foot mean? They told you the basis. But somebody else says, well, yeah, sure, that's, that's 2.1. But how many inches would that be? What would this guy in inch world measure? <coughs> well, here's a good question. Um, you're both having your favorite measurements, and then you have a reason for this. And you start coding it, and you start, well, okay, this thing takes this measurement, does this, does this, does this, and it says, please turn on the brakes at this moment. And as you did this, you assume the person put their values in feet. And somebody else handed values, but they gave you inches. Is something bad going to happen? Yeah, well, we had that. The classic example is that one lunar uh, <coughs> on Mars that just simply burned up and spread itself across. Why? I was using feet, you were using meters, sorry. <laughs> I gave you bad data, <laughs> and you didn't try to figure it out, so you didn't figure this out until you were about to land? It's like, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> How many millions did we just burn up? Right, but we ought to know that. So we have reasons for other basis, but obviously what do we need to do? We need to be able to do what? Convert. And so there should be a way for me to sit there and say things like, well, if somebody gave me 2.1 in the feet units, I should be able to do something to this so it spits out the appropriate values in the inch units. And what do you do? Every one foot is worth what? 12 inches. But if I write it this way, let's say we just write it this way here with division. Sorry, I got that upside down. Do, 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 do. 
What happens to my units of feet? They cancel, and I get my 25.2. So what, have you, what, what you've called change of units, you've really done change of basis. Now, if that's what we've been doing in one dimensional, how do I handle this with bases that have two vectors, or bases <coughs> that have three vectors, or bases that have four fourth dimensional vectors? How do I go through and do some, there's some reasons behind it, so obviously it makes sense because we've been doing it forever. But if we would go to say, for example, R2, and consider the following problem. Let's say we make the following weighted graph. And what you notice is for people who live in a city, from year after year, 94% of the people stay in the city, but then 6% of the people move to suburbs. But for suburbs, 98% of the people stay in the suburbs, but then 2% of the people go ahead and move into the city. Just a pretty straightforward way. Now, one of the things I talked about, that, that one that was presented uh, by West Point was, they took this and then moved it up to a scale and said, okay, what percentage of people who are not on drugs are still not on drugs year after year? What percentage of them move into heroin? What percentage of them become addicted to prescription drugs? What percentage of them will move over to marijuana? For people that are on marijuana, how many people keep marijuana? How many go clean to the non-drug <coughs> year after year? How many move on to heroin? How many enter a rehab program and eventually move into rehab, and then from rehab, how many stay in rehab, how many go back to drugs, how many go free? So you can start to see how these things are all going through. Now, if I want to, instead of representing it as this picture, I could represent this as a matrix, say matrix A. And matrix A, going to be made up of the following values where these are the froms. Say so that's from city, from suburb, and this is the two city, and this is the two suburb. And so this is the from city to city. So in my graph, how many from the city go to the city? How many from the suburb go to the city? How many from the city go to the suburb? And how many from the suburb go to the suburb? Now why would I want to do this? Well, if I would have vectors, say, x and r2, and this is just simply city, suburb. What would AX represent? Well, this here would be from city to city. This is from suburb to city. This is from city to suburb, and this is from the suburb to the suburb. If I multiply this by city suburb numbers, what will this spit out? This column vector times this row vector will be what? City numbers from city to city would be what? City people. Suburb times from suburb to city would convert it to city people. So this row column will spit out the new city people. How many people in the city stayed in the city? How many people in the suburb moved to the city? Add those together. Those are the new city people. What happens on the bottom? City to suburb, suburb to suburb, it's going to spit out the new suburb people. So in the end, what this means is 
A times, say, X0, which is how many people are here now? Multiply this by A, and it'll be how many people next year? Well, how can I find X2? How can I find X3? This system, where this matrix represents what you believe is going to happen year, 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 right? And every tick event is, you have to do the percentages you know, like per moment, whatever your time interval is. And so what's going to happen here is this forms a sequence, which will be, what is the city, suburb combination this year? And then next year, and then next year, and then next year. And this is called a Markov chain. This part over here, which does the work, is your Markov process. Now, if we would go super simple instead of city suburbs, you could go out and say, hey, how many people this year are drug free? What percentage of people? and then wait a year, and then just do another analysis, and then assume that year after year that the situation dynamics of the population are about the same. I could go back here and say things like, um, instead of going through here and having city suburbs, I could go and say clean drug. And why these things happen, and just from this, we would have what happens as this happens year after year after year after year. Now, one of the things that you would notice is since x1 was ax0 and x2 was ax1, but by the way, that was ax0, well, that's really a squared x0. And if I would continue this process, xn would really be a to the nth power x0. So a itself obviously is important. I'm applying A, I'm applying A, I'm applying A, I'm applying A year after year after year. Now obviously I could do this entire problem and leave it in standard units. <coughs> but would there be a different basis besides saying 1001 as a standard basis, which is what we would be doing? What's, what's 10? City only, suburb only. What's 01? No city, only suburb. Is there a better basis? And you kind of sit there and ask, well, that seems odd. Why would I want something besides only talking about cities and only talking about suburbs? Well, we'll learn this in a bit. We can study, but we don't have the technique yet. If we would study A, and notice that the following happens. If I would take A, and multiply it by 1, 3, it would spit out 1 times 1, 3. It's a very special vector. What does A do to it? Nothing. So this vector times A is A times this vector, order matters. Nothing happens. On the other hand, you could have, if I took A and multiplied it by negative 1, 1, that becomes 0 0.92 times negative 1, 1. Every other vector does some sort of shift. But these two vectors stay in the same direction, but change length. Everybody else, on the other hand, moves. Well, why would this be important? Well, If I would take this particular thing, we could go ahead and check. Are these two vectors independent? How do you check independence? Which part? Yep. Are you just assuming the values for A, or is that? No, A is still the same ones up above. Still the same ones. Same as above. This is continuum. Okay. 
We'll get to how these vectors, th these are called the eigenvectors with eigen associated eigenvalues. But we don't have those yet. We haven't done any of the eigenvalue stuff. But the eigenvectors eigenvalues for Markov processes are essentially that when you multiply by A, these special directions are special. <coughs> Any vector in this direction will stay in their direction, but correspondingly change by the eigenvalue. And the reason for it is, well, if I check these guys, how would I check for linear independence? If you have two vectors that are both R2, what's the quickest check? Determinant. <laughs> is this determinant? Just use determinant. What's the determinant? Four, which is not zero, so they're independent. Are we in R2? Yes. You found two vectors that are independent. What are they? A basis. That's that one theorem, right? I don't even have to check for anything else. Once I have depend I know that they're a basis because I need two for a basis. I have two things that are independent, they're a basis. And actually, I have two bases. So for any vector, say x, it could obviously be written as coordinate 1 times 1, 0, plus coordinate 2 times 0, 1, which would be, what would be coordinate 1? How many people are in the city? <laughs> What's coordinate 2? How many people are in the suburb? Or, if I want to, the exact same vector could be written as something times 1, 3, plus something times negative 1, 1. You look at that and say, oh my goodness, why would you want that basis? So your coordinates are now going to be some linear combination of one city, three suburbs, <laughs> and negative 1 cities in one suburb. That's kind of a weird coordinate system. But the reason why I'd be interested in the eigenvectors is because of this. I'm going to multiply by A over and over and over again. Well, fine. <coughs> Let's take that X0 and make whatever it is, which would be something times 1, 3 plus something times negative 1, 1. I don't know what those are right now, but I can find it. If you told me my initial city, if you tell me my initial city suburb population, I could go ahead and figure out what D1, D2 are. That would be hard to find, but it would be the coordinates. But on the other hand, what does matrix multiplication do? It distributes. And so this would be equal to D1, A to the N times 1, 3, plus D2, A to the N times negative 1, 1. Now, what is A to the N? A times A times, it's A times this, and A times that, and A times the next, and you just keep multiplying by A, right? But if you did your analysis on this, multiplying by A does what to 1, 3? Nothing. It stays 1, 3. Multiplying by negative 1, 1 by A, what does that do? It actually multiplies it by a 0.92. In other words, I can take that entire matrix and throw it away and replace it by 0.92. I can take that entire matrix, throw it away, and replace it by a 1. And I keep doing that over and over and over and over again. Well, if I do that all those times, a to the nx0 is really what? d1 times 1, 3, plus d2 times is 0.92 to the n, right? 0 0.92, 0 0.92, 0 0.92. There's a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 there. What is a number less than 1 multiplied over and over and over again? You keep going, that goes away. And so what's left? That. So what's happening? What's happening is, depending on whatever that coordinate I would have to figure out, if I do this process over and over and over again, the Markov chain goes to a stable state which is this many, whatever the coordinates were, of 1, 3. Which would be how much city, how much suburbs, times whatever you found for D1. <coughs> so what you found was, yes, there's people leaving, 
And it kind of it might even go against what you expected. Let's look back at this picture. Are as a larger percentage leaving the city compared to going from suburb to city? If you just said rough estimate, six percent leave, two percent come in, what would be your opinion should happen? Suburbs get big, city empties out. But if you actually do the, the solution to this thing, you can find the coordinates, the answer is that doesn't happen. It goes to a constant steady state, which is some multiple of one, three. In other words, it'll get to about this percentage in the city and this percentage in the suburb stays. It's like, wow, I didn't expect that. And it's like, well, where did this come from? A better basis, which is based upon the eigenvalues, eigenvectors. But this sort of study and looking at the steady states would be important. So can you start to see things like, well, what are all the models that you could possibly imagine doing with a digraph like this? You could do things like money spending, economics, here, 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 flow, stay, how things do it. And you just start to do it, and then all you have to do is make a matrix and then start studying the Markov process. Obviously, there are a lot of assumptions going on. Yeah, it happens to be the same year after year after year. And nothing major happens. So it's not a, the best assumption, but it's reasonable. <clears throat> now that we have such things, if somebody, it really kind of gets down to, well, if you told me the coordinates in the standard system, could you tell me the coordinates in this weird 1, 3, negative 1, 1 system? How do I change my coordinates? How do I change the coordinates for each basis? So change of basis. So it makes sense that I should be able to use different bases in the same way I can use feet to inches to centimeters to miles for one dimensional space and higher dimensional here is an example but it's left with could you figure out the coordinates standard was easy how many in the city how many in the suburb what's your new coordinate system I have to find those coordinates how do I do it well the entire change of basis is based upon a rather <laughs> straightforward statement. So if I would have basis in, say, V1, V2, up to Vn, and so V of dimension n, and I'm going to go ahead and collect all these guys as their own vector v1, v2, up to vn. What I'm going to do is by that whole <coughs> unique coordinate idea, which is a unique linear combination, where any vector is, say, so many of v1 plus so many of v2, plus so many of the n. Those coordinates are unique to spit out this place. Instead of writing it this way, I'm going to rather write this as being v, which is the bases, times c, which are the coordinates of v. It's the coordinates for my vector in basis. Now, here's here's kind of a bad. Or I probably shouldn't have done that. Oh well, that v is not that v. <laughs> um, I'll just say vector space. So you have a vector space of dimension n. So one concept is I collect the one basis that somebody came up with and I call it vector v. And then instead of writing my unique linear combination like that, I will choose to rather write my unique linear combination like that. Now why do I use the subnotation? We use the subnotation to keep track of its coordinates with related to somebody. That way if I ever choose to, by doing this, 
this allows me to go through a problem, and if you would ever show up and say, oh, look, I have one, two, three in basis Q, you would know, oh, you need one of the first vector of your basis Q, and then two of the second basis of your vector Q, and then three of the third basis of your third vector of your basis Q, and that's your unique linear combination. You need one of the first two, it's like, it's like well, one, two, and three of who? That allows you to say of who. It's like a little name. It's borrowing what I did way back here at the beginning with feet. 2.1 of who? Feet. 25.2 of who? Inches. That's what those little, when you say FT, that's what you're saying. What's your basis? Feet. What's your basis? Inches. Okay. But somebody else could walk along here and they had, so that'd be like my first basis, and somebody else could say, well, you know what, I had a better basis. You know, your V's are all interesting, but I have my U's that really make me happy. I have N of them, and I'm going to let, say, capital U, and I'm going to collect U1, U2, up to UN. Okay, but again, we have unique linear combinations because they're a basis, they're linearly independent. So there's, it's going to have its own unique coordinates. So any vector x would be, say, d1, u1, plus d2, u2, plus dn, un. So somebody came up and said, let's say you came and said, I like v, the standard basis, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Somebody says, no, nah, I like mine. Mine is 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. <laughs> and those are linearly independent. It's like, OK. It's like, then what are your coordinates? It'll be d1, d2, d3. Again, if we collect it this way, then x would be equal to u times the coordinates in the u space. Where again, these d's here, written in this notation, are really just d1 to dn. Again, these are coordinates in the u basis. Now, this entire problem for conversion of coordinates is based upon one thing. Equal stuff are equal. So if you both found the same vector, they have to be equal. So our entire change of basis, and there's like multiple pages in this book, can be shortened to the following thing. Equal things are equal. X has to be X, obviously. So what does that mean? That means V times, well, what are the coordinates in the V space? And U times, well, what are the coordinates in the U space? Have to be equal. And really, that's it. So if we would have a particular problem, if I would say my vector space V is a standard basis, 1, 0, and 0, 1. And so, oops, I don't know why I did that. And somebody else said, no, my vector space was 1, 3, and negative 1, 1. And the standard basis was the one that, let's say, the person's you know, working out with. And they say, OK, you know what? I have the following. Um, I know that the coordinates in the standard space was say 75 and 0.25. In other words, what they said was if 75% of my population is in the city and 25% of my population is in the suburbs. That's what, but that's what their coordination, that's what their coordinates were for them. Now my question is, uh, I wonder what the coordinates are for the U space. <laughs> 
How do I find that? Well, v times the coordinates in the v space has to be u times the coordinates in the u space. Well, what's v? 1, 0, 0, 1. What are the coordinates? 0 0.75, 0 0.25. What is u? 1, 3, negative 1, 1. What are the coordinates? Uh, that's what I'm trying to find. Can I do that? Sure. What would I have to do? I would have to simply take u inverse, multiply it on both sides, and I will find the coordinates. And so for our problem, I would need to have, well, since v is nice, it's just i, right? But if I wrote it the long way, it would be, what is 1, 3, negative 1, 1 inverse times u, 1, 0, 0, 1, all times 0 0.75, 0 0.75, 0 0.25, and what will this spit out? The coordinates in u. And which was the whole point for like the example way above. <laughs> I have to figure out those coordinates. And this would allow me to do it. But what do I need to be able to do? Can you find the inverse of a matrix? Why do I know the inverse exists? The determinant's not zero, and I would always know the determinant's not zero no matter what the size it is, because it's a basis. It's linearly independent. I'm guaranteed it has to have an inverse. It wouldn't be a basis if it wasn't linearly independent. The bases are linearly independent, so this will always exist. So if I ever want to change coordinates, so if we would have, say, basis V to basis U, coordinates. What do we do? We use that v times any coordinates in the v space. It has to be u times the coordinates in the u space. If I want to go from v to u, take this guy and move it to the other side. u inverse v, the coordinates of v will spit out the coordinates in u. On the other hand, what if we want to go the other way? What if it says, I want to go from basis u to basis v coordinates? Well, you just take the v and move it to the other side. And you would notice that you had v inverse u times the coordinates of u will spit out the coordinates of v. Now, obviously, a matrix times a matrix is a matrix. So if you took those two matrices, you find the inverse, find this matrix, multiply the two, get a single matrix, that would be called the transition matrix from U to V. <coughs> if I choose to multiply that all out and get a single matrix, that would be the transition matrix from V to U. But you can always do that if you want, because it's nice. Get a single matrix, and this matrix does all the coordinate transforms. It's kind of like, how do I convert feet to inches? If you want to convert feet to inches, you would take 12 divide, you multiply everything by 12. This is the conversion. And really, what do I do? This is the inverter, and that's the, you know, that's that's these numbers represent the matrices themselves, and inverses that end up being reciprocals when we have things as simple as straightforward as a scale. But as we do this, if you want, you can turn that into a single matrix if you want. But on the other hand, when you look at this, one of the things that you could realize that happens is you could look at this as a process. If you have the coordinates in a basis, say basis u, and you multiply it by u, it creates coordinates in standard. So this multiplication spits out the coordinates in standard basis. But then when I multiply by an inverse basis, it takes the standard and spits out the coordinates of V. 
So a matrix multiply converts what basis it is to standard. The inverse of that matrix takes standard to the basis. So if I wanted to, I could do a multi-step process. And I could do this whole, I could take inches to feet to centimeters to meters. It's like, well, how do you do that? It's like, well, you take all, you stack in the appropriate order. So how do I go from basis U to basis Q if I have a bunch of bases in the middle? You would appropriately do, okay, multiply by this, it goes to standard, multiply by this, it goes to this basis, multiply by that, it goes to standard. And so you can just go through and stack these appropriately. But you have to understand what multiplying by a basis matrix does. What would happen if I multiplied a matrix like U times the coordinates in some other basis? Bad thing. It's expecting certain things to be applied to it. Right? That's that whole, this guy U, what is he expecting? He's expecting to multiply things in the coordinates of U. If somebody decides to put in the coordinates of V, you just crash something into Mars and threw away millions of dollars. Right? There's expectations <laughs> on these problems. But this here, for all of your work, all there's like four or five pages in the book, all of it is just simply that right there. If you understand that equality, same space, same place is same place. And from there, you can just work it out for individual transforms. <laughs> that is that entire section. Any questions on that? What's one of the things that I asked, that I didn't even do on this problem? I didn't even actually go ahead and multiply this thing out. Right? What are the things that we need to be able to do? What's the expectation? Once we show that the understanding is, well, I'm going to take the inverse of this matrix, multiply by that matrix, and multiply by this vector, and I'm going to get that vector. The assumption is you can do that. The problem is here in class is it takes a while. So I'll just assume you can do it, but that also means what do you do today? Go and do this. And this was a two by two. What happens if I have coordinates in three space? You'll have a basis, three vectors, all of three values, another basis, three vectors. So I'm going to have an inverse multiply, three, right, three by three, three by three, times a three by one, and get out another coordinate system. So if it's fourth dimensional, it starts going up. Any questions on that? Could I multiply it? Sure, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Actually, no, wait, here. Anybody, can anybody think of a short way for you first off you look at that who cares that's the identity so we can just completely drop that off now inverse of a vector what's what's a quick way to do this well how do you find inverses? You find inverses by doing this, right? And you do all the row ops until that shows up on the left. But what does this really do? What this is really doing is taking the elementary ops, elementary matrix, elementary matrix, elementary matrix, times the identity. What is it doing? Every <coughs> elementary matrix you do is working on this side. That also means that instead of putting the identity over here, I'm actually not interested in the inverse. I'm interested in the inverse times 0 0.75, 0 0.25. So if I want to, is just drop that and do 0 0.75, 0 0.25. Do the same work. The moment the identity shows up, what's going to be over here? The inverse times 0.75. 0.25. In other words, don't <coughs> find the inverse, use the inverse. <laughs> and all the work you do would eventually become what the inverse times it would have been. I'm just doing it at one elementary up, at one elementary matrix at a time. And so what would you do first? Well, this is already a one. So what would you do first? 
I would take negative three of these and add it to these, which would be zero. This is where fractions would make life easier. Right? Negative three of these, and th that would be a zero. What is negative three of these? Three. And that? Four. Okay, negative three of these. Negative nine fourths, and one fourth. So that's negative two. And now what? That needs to be a one. So that's pretty easy to do. And this would be? And now I need to, well, what am I going to do? I don't know why I did 0.75, 3 fourths. I'll just add those two. And if I just add those two, this is a? Zero. Zero. And that one would be? One just one fourth? And so what I found was 75% of the people in the city and 25% of people in the suburb, standard notation, is 0.25 times the 1, 3 plus a negative 0.5 times negative 1, 1. And you look at these and say, well, these coordinates no longer make standard sense, not standard basis sense. But in terms of using them, it makes more sense because what does this guy do? If I keep applying this matrix over and over again, that goes to zero, and what happens? It becomes 0.25 of 1, 3, which means when I actually multiplied it, if we go back all the way, this is 0.25, which is 1 fourth, and then 3 fourths, right? So what happens? Steady state is 25% of your population will be in the city, and 75% of your population 